All right. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, BBC Sunday Night. Uh, can I welcome you from wherever you are, whether you are on your couch or watching on your phone or in places that you would rather publicly not mention? It is great to have you here with us tonight. Um, my name is Colin. I am the pastor of Golden Sands Baptist Church, uh, which is over in Papamo on the east side of the city. Um, it's like the best place to be. It's the better side of the city, in my opinion. And I'm so excited to be here with you. I, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I used to actually be on staff here at BBC four years ago, actually. Um, yeah, wow, that went by fast. Uh, it was four years ago when I came on staff, and I had a lot to do with Sunday nights and worship nights and preaching. And so I've got a real uh, soft spot in my heart for you guys as a community. And I'm stoked to be here, although it's not quite how I anticipated being here when I was asked to preach here a few months ago. But life is what it is, and I'm still glad that I get to share with you tonight. Um, look, those of you who have been journeying with us on Sunday nights, you know that we are in the midst of a series on Isaiah. There's hope in the darkness, and it's questions of exile and faith, and where is God when things get really, really hard? And it's been a really, really fascinating season. But before we do that, I have a question for you. And it's a really important question. Usually you can divide everyone in the world into one of these two camps. Um, People often talk about, are you a good driver or a bad driver? But I don't think that's the most interesting question. I think the more interesting question is, are you a good passenger or a bad passenger? Because there's definitely ones in between. You've got the passengers who are chill, happy to go along for the ride. They know how to run the DJ job and they put good tunes. And then you get the passengers who you notice don't like being out of control very much. Uh, maybe, and even if you're watching, maybe you can even write on there, are you more of a control freak passenger or are you super chill? Or maybe you can even dob someone in who you know is watching who's not a good passenger and you can just throw them a little bit of love. Um, but I remember this for me, um, when I was learning how to drive, uh, I grew up in Mexico City, so the driving was super intense and it was very a high stress environment. And that was what my parents were used to. But when they taught me, it was actually for a summer when I was up in Texas. And the roads in Texas are wildly different. Mexico is frantic and tight and, and stressful. Texas is just huge. Like you can go 120 Ks all the time because it's Texas and who cares, right? And so uh, my mom was taking me and she's giving me some of those driving lessons. And hi, mom, if you're watching, I love you. Um, and as we were driving, I was doing the right thing, right? I got my hands on 10 and two and I'm paying attention to the road and I'm checking my mirrors religiously, doing all the things that I need to do. I feel really stressed and I'm trying to do my best. And I noticed this pattern of something would happen is as we're driving, we'd be coming up to a stoplight or we'd be approaching other cars. And as we're approaching, I would just hear this sound that was just like a Doof! And I was like, what? what, what is that sound? Couldn't figure out what it was. So we keep on driving. And sure enough, we approach another stoplight. And as we're going, I'm like decelerating and I hear Doof! trying to figure out what is wrong with the car. Like, am I breaking it? And then we come up to a third stoplight. And as we go, out of the corner of my eye this time, I see a flurry of movement as that sound hits again. Doof! And I realized what the sound was, is that was my mother's foot extending at 100 Ks an hour down to the floor of the end of the car as she was desperately searching for that brake pedal, which she knows should be there. It's like as I was driving, whenever I passed that threshold of when she thought I should brake, her foot shot out for control to try and control the pace of the car and slow us down there. Um, it's like the same exact reason. You got passengers who don't love being out of control. It's the same reason you have that handle up on the side. You know that handle when you get into the car that you wonder, what on earth is this there for? Well, we all know that clearly it's there for mothers who are terrified at their kids driving so they can hold on to it and go, oh, Jesus, 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 and stomp their foot in. And it's like by holding on to that and stomping our feet, we can get this sense of control again. And that's a little bit what I want to talk to us about tonight is this sense of fear and control and how they're so linked together. The more we fear things, the more we feel like there's chaos all around us, like things aren't safe and they're not making sense, the more desperately we crave control in whatever way we can find it, whether that's through an imaginary brake pedal on the floor or the Jesus handle on the side of the door. Uh, we long for control when we feel afraid. And if anything, this last year with COVID 
it has just shown that to be even more true. The world likes to think of itself as predictable and in control and like we know what was happening, but suddenly there's a virus that throws everything out the window. And even here in New Zealand, we kind of thought we'd beat it, right? I did. I was like, cool, we're done with that lockdown stuff. It's fine. And then sure enough, eight, 10 weeks later, here we are again. And that, that sense of chaos around us, that sense of um, that fear that can come in us can cause us to be just desperate for control, desperate to hold on to something that will give us a sense of order in the, our chaotic world. And honestly, I think sometimes the conspiracy theories that we're hearing arise from all the corners of the internet about shadowy governments and movements coming through, part of me thinks that's us trying to wrestle for an element of control. Sometimes it feels more in control to know you're on the inside of the story of some big sinister plot than to deal with maybe the more scary reality, which is no one knows what's going on. No one knows what's happening. It's chaos, it's scary, and we long for control. It's that very feeling that I want us to engage with because as we've been going through Isaiah, that's the feeling that Israel would have had as they would have heard the words of this prophet the first time. If you remember uh, the work that's been done so far is that where we are in Isaiah, the first chunk is all about um, Isaiah is warning them saying, hey, careful, you need to change your behavior, your sin, your wickedness, the way you're treating the poor, the corruption in your government. God's saying, I will not tolerate this forever. And then at the end of chapter 39, God sends then Babylon and he destroys Jerusalem, he destroys the temple and he takes them into exile. And we find Israel in Babylon as refugees scattered amongst the people and a language that's not so familiar to them with a culture that is so different and they feel afraid. They feel like there's chaos all around them. And you can imagine them wrestling for control. The promises that they thought they stood on aren't cutting it anymore. The promises that God would preserve them well, those didn't seem to hold true. That God is mighty to save. Well, he didn't this time. So they're looking for something to latch onto, something to give them control. And so today we are going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 44 as we talk about fear and control. Where is God in the midst of that? What is Jesus doing in that? So if you have your Bibles, can I encourage you to turn to Isaiah 44? We'll have some of the words on the screen. Um, but also, it, chances are you're probably watching me on your phone or some digital device. Now is a good time to advocate for get yourself a paper Bible. I know it sounds old school, but often I meet heaps of people that are like, I want to get better at reading the Bible. Honestly, get it off your phone where you're so distracted and get it onto paper where you can check your phone somewhere else. And it's so much easier. So we're going to be in Isaiah 44 and we're going to work through that just today and find a really helpful message in it. So the context of where we're at in Isaiah 44 is, if you remember Monica last week, finished with these real big promises of hope. But right at the end of her passage, it actually takes a turn. God's been promising hope and restoration and that's really encouraging. But then he does this little thing where he begins to remind them of all the terrible things that they've done. So if you look on Isaiah 43, just go back up a few verses, up to verse 26, and you can see God saying, he's talking to Israel. Let, review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. State, state the case for your innocence. See, your father, your first father sinned, and those I sent to teach you, well, they rebelled against me. So I disgraced the dignitaries of your people. I consigned Jacob to destruction and Israel to scorn. And it's like God's reminding them like, hey, the reason you're here is because of the way you are acting. It's because of your sin. It's because of your selfishness and your jealousy and the way you abuse people. You got yourselves into the situation. Don't look at me. You firmly put yourselves here through your own actions, which can feel a little bit like he's rubbing their nose in salt. Like most people probably then would have been like, I get it. I know. But then he then goes and makes some promises. And here in Isaiah 44, verse one, you see, but now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I've chosen. This is what the Lord says. He who made you and formed you in the womb and who will help you. Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, 
and Jeshurun, whom I've chosen. And Jeshurun means someone who stands upright, which is a pretty ironic description for Israel right now. Verse three, he says, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. And some will say, I belong to the Lord. Others will call themselves by the name of Jacob and still others will write on their hand, the Lord's and will take the name of Israel. And it's almost like what you've got happening here in Isaiah is it's like God is reminding them of where they stand. He's saying, look, you're here because of your actions. You, your choices clearly led you into this space, but I will restore you. But it's fascinating the way God says it. It's almost like saying, I'm going to fix you, but not because you've done anything to deserve it. Not because you've manipulated me or because you said all the right words, not because you have suddenly made me suddenly feel nice again through all of your sad things. No, 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 I'm not manipulable. God says, I will restore you because I choose to, because this is who I am. This is my action. I will redeem you, which is, leaves Israel in a space of not a lot of control. If you can imagine them being scared and trying to understand control, God's saying, look, there's hope, but it's on my terms, not on yours. And that can be a disconcerting feeling. I mean, they felt like God just failed them already, right? Like Jerusalem's already burnt, they're already exiles, but God's now saying, no matter what you do, you can't manipulate me into healing you. I will do it on my own terms. It's a challenge for them. And you can imagine them still wanting to wrestle for control somewhere else looking for something else that might bring order to their chaotic world. And it's here that Isaiah then turns to a conversation that is pretty weird for us. He ends up talking about idols and he does it in the form of a diss track. Now, I know diss tracks might not be familiar for everyone. Uh, It might not necessarily be the best illustration for Bethlehem, but um, diss tracks are a common thing in rap and hip hop. And I apologize for those of you who love rap and hip hop. This next segment is going to feel very white simply because of, well, this. So apologies for that. It's going to feel white. But what it is essentially is in hip hop, you have this really common trope. Uh, This common thing that would happen is if you get two rappers who are trying to vie for uh, popularity and to make themselves on top and to get the most clout and everything, um, often they get into a fight with each other. And then, then rather than just duking it out, they release music and the whole track is aimed at tearing down or insulting or basically just wrecking the other person's reputation through poetry, through rhymes, through rhythm, through uh, wordplay. They're pretty fantastic. And there's some really famous ones. Um, One of the most famous ones of all time is uh, No Vaseline by Ice Cube when he does to NWA. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about NWA in church, but I did. I go to a different one. It's a great band, Um, some of it. And uh, so anyway, that's a really famous one where he then uh, attacks his old famous band members. Uh, If you're not familiar with that, another one would be like Eminem. If you know the movie Eight Mile, at the end of Eight Mile, you have these rap battles where each rapper tries to take on the other person and one up them in the point of the rap battle. Uh, But that might be a bit old for some of you. So probably the most recent example is if you have recently gotten Disney Plus, you might be aware of the uh, show Hamilton, which is viewable on there, which is an amazing Broadway musical, all mostly done in rap and hip hop style. And in Hamilton, you've got these cabinet battles where Hamilton and Jefferson will fight against each other in rap with George Washington in the middle kind of presiding over it. And what you have here is it's this through prose and literature and poetry, you have this amazing attack and critique of someone else. And what we have here in Isaiah 44, when he shifts to talking about idols, is you have basically the equivalent of a diss track from like 2,500 years ago in a very old prophetic style. And I want us to read it. It may seem like a weird turn, but it makes a lot of sense in the end. And I want to read it because genuinely in Isaiah, this is, Isaiah is a literary genius. Honestly, he is incredible the way he weaves together poetry and prophecy and theology in such uh, perfect ways. And I want want us to read this together because it is incredible. So this section here is on Isaiah and it's 44 and it's verses nine through 20. 
And I want to read it. And this is where Isaiah just lays in to the cultures of idols and idol worship. He says, all who make idols are nothing. And the things that they treasure are worthless. Those who would speak up for them, they're blind. They're ignorant to their own shame. For who shapes a God and casts an idol, which can profit them nothing? People who do that will be put to shame. Such craftsmen, they're only human beings. Look, let them all come together and take their stand, and they'll be brought down to terror and shame. The blacksmith takes a tool, and he works it within the coals, and he shapes an idol with hammers, and he forges it with the might of his arm. But he gets hungry, and he loses his strength. He drinks no water, and he'll grow faint. The carpenter, he measures with a line. He makes an outline with a marker. He roughs it out with chisels and he marks it out with a compass and he shapes it into human form, human form in all of its glory that it may dwell in a shrine. He cuts down cedars or perhaps a cypress or an oak. He lets it grow among the trees of the forest or a planted pine in the rain to make it grow. But that's used for fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and he warms himself with it. He kindles a fire. He bakes bread. Oh, but then he also fashions a god and he worships it. Oh, he makes an idol and he bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire. And over it, he prepares a meal. He roasts his meat and he eats his fill. And he also warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I see the fire. Now, if you're an early reader on this, you're just like, there'd have been multiple moments where you're like, oh, snap, oh, snap. Like it's getting bigger and bigger. So he heats himself and he says, I see the fire, I'm warm. But then from the rest of that wood, he makes a God, his idol. He bows down to it and he worships. He says to it, he prays to it and he says, save me, you are my God. But they know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see. And their minds are closed so they cannot understand. But yet somehow no one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or the understanding to say, well, half of it I used for fuel and I even baked over its coals. I roasted meat and I eat. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Such a person feeds on ashes and a deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, is not this thing in my right hand a lie? It's incredible. I mean, you might be sitting there thinking, well, that was kind of lame. That feels old. But for the time, for the people who have heard it, for the Israelites who are listening to this in exile, as they look at the idols all around them, it would have been like a bomb drop. He finishes that. It's a mic drop moment. Everyone's like, Ooh, someone's going to get killed by the, for this. Like it was heavy. It's a devastating critique. And it tears apart the very foundations and the hopes for control that Israel was looking for. But again, it's, it's hard for us to stand, understand 2,500 years later. We're not really that big into idols. We like to think of ourselves as modern and <laughs> enlightened and uh, better than that. So it's worth understanding why idols were such a big deal. Why did they worship idols so much even at that time? And it all has to do, again, with order and chaos. See, one of the views of these ancient peoples is their whole world was built on this idea that chaos was all around them. Now, remember, this is pre uh, the Industrial Revolution. This is pre-literacy and, and, and lot wide literacy amongst everyone. This is pre-medicine. And so chaos felt like always around the corner. Wild animals could at any point come and attack you. Famine was unknown and could show up at any point in time. You were utterly out of control of the weather and the rains to grow food. There might be a foreign kingdom that you had no idea about that suddenly makes its way over the hill and attacks you. Chaos felt everywhere for them. And so, so much of this ancient form of thought was trying to bring order out of chaos. And that was the role of the gods. The gods would help fashion elements of the chaos and they would rein it in under their control. Marduk, the Babylonian god, was fertility and rains. You'd have others that looked after uh, birthing. You'd have others that looked after war. And the idea was if you could build an idol, if you could fashion it well enough, 
If you could do your best to bring it together, then the God might come and fill that idol with his presence. And if you gave the right incantations, if you prayed the right prayers, then that little bit of chaos would suddenly be under your control. That God would listen to you. And whether it was asking for more rain, asking for victory in battle, asking for offspring that you've never had, if you could get the presence of God into that idol, if you crafted it well enough, if you said the right things, if you did the right prayers, if you worshiped in just the right way, then the gods would come down and fill it and you could be in control. The God would do your bidding. And for them, that was why it was such an appealing thing. You'd have these idols and you could get control from them. And you could imagine Israel, when Yahweh had failed them or seen to have failed them, they'd want to turn to some of these idols. Well, if Yahweh didn't make any difference, maybe Marduk will. Maybe Ishtar will. Maybe one of these other gods, if we turn to them at this point, they might give us the control that we want. They might redeem our line. They might give us the hope that we've longed for. It's order and chaos. If they just said the right thing, they could be in control. Now for us, um, we don't like to think of ourselves as idolatrous. We like to think of ourselves as modern and forward thinking. We like to think of ourselves as having it all together and the world is under our control. We're a good secular age, right? I'm not convinced. Honestly, I'm not convinced. Yeah, sure, we may not worship idols in the same way. We may not fashion wood in the same way, but the idea that chaos is all around us and we are desperate to find something transcendent that will control it for us, oh, I still think that is very, very much alive. But in our Western context, maybe it's not so much out there, but maybe it's more in here. Alan Nobles, who's a fantastic writer, thinks a lot about the church and our engagement with secularism and the secular age. And he talks about it. He describes our current situation like this. He says, building up to and during the 20th century, Western civilization slowly shifted the focus of our hope from a transcendent source in God who forms us to finding it deep within ourselves. Our identity And our ability to choose its features becomes the basis for our being in the world rather than some outside authority. He goes on to say, at the heart of our secular age is the individual in their effort to create and project their identity in a chaotic and hostile world. Our idols are maybe not as transcendent, but they've moved inward. And when you think about the way Isaiah describes these idol makers with perfect craft and care, forging even the most detailed elements, carefully constructing these idols, you can't help but parallel the same way that we often carefully construct and form ourselves. I think of our teenagers who look in the mirror and they see a body, a form, an image that they're just utterly unhappy with. There's no way the presence of the gods of fame and popularity would dwell in that. And so with anxious, bated breath, they begin working furiously to craft that image. They begin to specifically choose the clothes, the image, the names, the labels, the weight, the food, the exercise. All of it becomes just like these idol makers, a crafting work to form ourselves into that image of sacred control that the gods might come and dwell in us, that we might have control you know, through social acceptance, popularity, <laughs> friendships. You think of the way that we carefully curate and construct every single element of our digital footprint online. Every photo, every selfie, selfie is carefully run through a source of filters. The caption is thought over multiple times so that we give off just the right image that we want to. Engaging, upbeat, but also socially aware of the issues, but not too in-depth as to be challenged on them because we're scared of some of the answers to those. And now some of us maybe say, no, I put raw things on social media, but are not even some of those posts carefully curated vulnerable moments in order to show yourself an engaging person? How easily the way that our phones and Instagram and Facebook turns our lives even into a filter that we have to run everything through thinking, how can this be shared for mass consumption 
that people might want to come and dwell. The gods of acceptance might dwell in us. It's not that. This has been done for ages. Anyone who's owned a business, countless people in careers, bosses desperate to maintain an image of in control, of knowing the answers, of having a clear path of the way forward, of being the visionary, of having the direction to the future. And when we're challenged, we push that away. We carefully construct that image and hold on to it because if that image shatters, then the gods of success will have left us and we will be left with nothing. We'll be back to chaos. The, 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 the thing that drew Israel is still the very thing that draws, draws us. We long for meaning, identity, and completeness. But around us, there is chaos and there is fear and we are desperate for control. And the story of our modern age is so many of us try to wrestle that control from ourselves. Form ourselves into that image. Save ourselves. Which if you remember, was the very thing That at the beginning of this chapter, God said they cannot do. Israel, you cannot save yourself here. And here at the end of the chapter, Isaiah circles back to that same message. He says, remember these things, Jacob. For you, Israel, are my servant. I have made you. You are my servant. Israel, I will not forget you. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. What's fascinating about all this idol imagery is that in Genesis, we have all that story. In Genesis, you have God bringing order out of chaos. Even the very words at the beginning of Genesis where God hovered over the waters That chaos word, that waters word is the very same word that God uses to describe these idols. Nothingness, the forces of chaos. And when we go back to Genesis, God says, I have created order, sun, moon, light, dark, day, night, land, sea, fish, birds. God has separated them and he's brought order. And at the very center of this ordered creation, God begins to fashion something quite like the idol makers fashioned something. He digs down into the dirt and from the earth, he forms an image, an image of himself, which he then breathes life into and says, you are mine. The great folly of idolatry is we're constantly trying to force and form ourselves and look for control in other places. And the whole time God is saying, you already are my image. You already are mine. But we all know that we have failed at that image countless times. We all fall short of being that. We all deeply know that we are not the human that we want to be. And this is where the great news of the gospel comes through. Jesus is the only one of us who was able to be that human. The only image who did not choose to wrestle control for himself. The only image who didn't try to eat from the tree of good and evil and define good and evil on his own terms. The only one who didn't reach out to other idols and other forms to create that sense of being the one human who stayed with God. And in his death and resurrection, his life, he says, is on offer to each and every one of us. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot form ourselves. We cannot bring ourselves back in. Idolatry is just another attempt to bring order out of chaos. But the truth is, as humans, we cannot do that on our own. But Jesus says, abide in me. Come and be a part of me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Attach yourself to me and I will restore you. So what Isaiah says to Israel is the same thing that we can hear today. You cannot save yourself. You're not God. No matter how much you try to form yourself into the image that you think you need to be, it will leave you unsatisfied. Instead, come back to Jesus. Cast yourself upon him. Let his life flow through you and in him you will find the hope 
and the life that you need, the order that pushes back the chaos is in him. And so I want to finish tonight with wherever you are and wherever you're watching from. Can I encourage you to take a moment to pause and take a deep breath right now, whether you're watching this live or you're watching this later at another point, whether you're doing the dishes or you're hoovering and you've got this in your ears, can I encourage you right now just for two minutes to pause and rest and think. In our lives, so much of ourselves, we are trying to cover up. We are trying to be the best us that we are. And most of us live under a mountain of shame for not measuring up to the idol that we think we need to be. We're not the parents we think we are. We're not the friends we others assume we are. And we're racked with insecurity about that. And I, I fear that so many of us are exhausted trying to keep up those appearances. Can I invite you to pause right now? And invite the spirit to speak to you. Do you have any idols that you are working so hard to craft? Working so hard to make work just so that you might get that bit of control. Can I encourage you to lay those down? You do not need to be your own savior. God says, return to me for I have restored you. Not return to me and then I will restore you. Return to me so that I can restore you. No, God says, return to me for I have restored you. Today, know that God is with you. Cast yourself onto him. Let go of those expectations to be the idol and the God that others and you expect yourself to be. God loves you. God has chosen you. God has redeemed you and you do not need to be anything more than who he has made you to be. And you can find that rest in him. And as Isaiah says, remember these things for I have chosen you. You are my servant. I will not forget you. Let's pray. Jesus if we have given ourselves over to idols, if we have been working so hard to craft these images that we think will give us the protection from the chaos around us, whether it's our own, our own physical body image, whether it's our professional image, whether it's our digital image, our friendship image that we give off to the people around us, if we have been working to craft those till our fingers are bleeding, would you spirit come and help us to lay down those tools right now? to give up the thought that we have to be all things to everyone. Let your peace fill us and remind us that you are the one who redeems. You are the one who saves. You are the one who restores. And so today, tonight, we call out to you afresh and say, Jesus, save us, form us, heal us. In your name we pray, amen. May God bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. And this week, with all the madness and everything we're facing and whatever you have going on in your life, I pray that you will know his peace. God bless.